Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and uh, thank you for joining me again. And as usual, I have been focused on autoimmunity around COVID-19 since March 2020. And that understanding has helped me to see parts of the pandemic that can predict what's happening and explain why it's happening at different stages in our timeline. And so today I want to focus a bit on what appears to be immune suppression at a population level. And specifically, I'll be highlighting this study or this information that has been coming out recently out of uh, the US about Candida auris fungal infections and the fact that it is spreading at an alarming rate in the, U the United States. It's also happening in the UK, probably not as, as significant, but it probably represents a new trend. And the, the parallel seems to be what happened with monkeypox, which is still a pandemic with over 85,000 cases across the world, for which nobody seems to be interested anymore. And the question is why? But before I start this, I want to highlight an important opportunity for those who are interested in joining my Learn World School at a deeper level. And here is the UK data mortalysis uh, analysis that I did recently. And I did this as a presentation. If you are interested to be part of a free taster course to the school, please click on the link below. My hope is that I'll be able to use this information to help people to understand more about autoimmunity, COVID-19, and the pandemic as a whole. So back to our topic, immune suppression at a population level. This is a biggie. And as usual, I will make reference to the elephant in the room. I still can't say what exactly this elephant is, but for those who are in the know, you will understand what I mean but we'll come back to that shortly. So this is all about a fungal infection, Candida auris, which is spreading across the United States. It was first identified in 2009. And you can see here in this image that um, this is the BBC, a deadly fungal infection, hard to treat and spreading rapidly at an alarming rate. It's doubled from 2021 from 756 to 1471 based on the CDC reports. And it's causing some concerns because it seems to be resistant to normal antifungal in, um, therapy. That's right. The cases are resistant um, to antifungal medicine, which means that it could end up being critical in terms of mortality for people who get affected. And even the CDC is giving some general information about it here, general information about Candida auris. And they are just talking about the fact that healthcare facilities in several countries have reported that this fungal infection is spreading, causing severe disease in hospitalized patients. And as well, it's a drug resistant germ that spreads in healthcare facilities. And it can cause serious infections uh, it is oftentimes resistance to medicine, and it's becoming more common. Now, these are important points. And I guess the question is, why now? Is it just another routine change in the epidemiology across the world that is making this an issue? And it could be. But I am naturally a little bit concerned when this is not the first time it has happened. Because as far as I'm concerned, and I'll do a presentation on this soon, monkeypox hasn't disappeared. It's still there. And to be frank, we haven't come up with a sensible explanation as to why monkeypox is still such a major issue across the world. So are we seeing the growth of another one? And why would it be occurring at this time? Are we seeing an immune system suppression at population level across the world? And it brings me to a very interesting paper. And this was done, um, I'll show you this full screen, and it's talking about the immune paradox of SARS-CoV-2, lymphocytopenia and autoimmunity, um, evoking features of COVID-19 and possible treatment modalities. I'll warn you that um, the link is behind a paywall if you want to see it, but it goes into quite a bit of detail. And I've had the pleasure of interviewing uh, these people at different times. There's Valentino, there's Joachim, 
uh, there's Manan, there's Mark, there's me, and in that conference we had uh, Dr. Marek from FLCCC, and we were looking at long COVID. So this group came together and put that paper, um, which is still very valuable. And they were looking specifically at some patterns that occurred with regards to the infection of cells by SARS-CoV-2. And so we knew before, and I've done a presentation on the immunodeficiency that can occur with regards to SARS-CoV-2, and there are a number of factors that can cause it. And you can see in this picture here, it's talking about the lymphocytes and macrophages and so on as being part of that picture. But for those who don't fully understand it, that may seem a little bit complicated. So I'll, I'll break it down a little bit more when we're talking about how this is relevant in terms of the immune system. So here is a picture of our immune system. And essentially, uh, this immunity uh, comes from the bone marrow and it splits into these progenitor cells and goes into a myeloid and a lymphoid group. And this is how your body fights infections. It's very sophisticated. Everything is overlapped, knows what it's doing, and it's very targeted. What's interesting in the context of infection with SARS-CoV-2 is that you tend to lose your T lymphocytes here. They are taken out. And your NK cells, natural killer cells, can be taken out. It tends to leave the B cells alone to produce antibodies. Additionally, your monocytes can be affected as well because of they have ACE2 on them. And so these are taken out as well, just leaving your neutrophils as your main way of protection. That's a problem. And this kind of pattern could explain why this is potentially occurring in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's likely that it's going to be more complicated than that. And the question is, why would this happen now? Why would this not have happened at a much more significant level in 2020 when we had no mitigations? And that brings us to the question of the elephant in the room. Is this a contributing factor to what we can be seeing occurring in different parts of the world? I had asked this question again, as I said, with monkeypox. No one has yet answered the question what percentage of the monkeypox cases had elephants? It's going to be a similar question with regards to Candida auris. Is there a factor that could be a contributor to the mechanism of the symptoms? Now, one of the big ones is interferon. And interferon is essentially produced by infected cells by virus. These little red particles are virus going inside a cell. And then the cell that is infected releases these interferons, and it does a number of things, including warning other cells. One of the problems that we seem to have with regards to areas that have high levels of elephants is that you then have the body producing what are called IgG4 antibodies. And these IgG4 antibodies are tolerant antibodies. So they are not actually fighting the infection. And so when you look at this picture here, what would be happening is that the virus would still be able to replicate inside the cells. The IgG4 could bind to virus, but it doesn't trigger an immune response. This will mean quite possibly that Omicron will become persistent. And the most important characteristic of Omicron infections is that it suppresses interferon. And interferon works for all viral infections. So not just viral infections, but also strep A. And I think if I'm right, it may have an impact with regards to some of the fungal infections as well. So in fact, in fact what we have in interferon suppression, largely because the immune system is no longer able or even trying to neutralize the virus. That's pretty serious. And this could explain why we're starting to see a higher level of organisms that are much more resistant and are unable to be controlled by the immune system. This is really, really important because if this is the case, 
we are only starting to see these things occurring. This is just the beginning because what we would have is a persistent immune suppression across the population. And just remember this, even though it may not be you, because the way how this works, it doesn't affect everyone. It tends to affect the subset of the population that are most at risk, that have conditions that already take out one or two layers of their immunity. And so therefore, when you put this on top of it, they are the most likely to then have these unusual infections, like what would happen with a candida auris. And the importance of that is that if they are at risk for that, and they are at risk for other infections, it also could mean that we have higher rates of spread for other viral infections, influenza, RSV, strep A. This is relevant to everybody. And so it's essential for us all to continue to look for answers. My challenge to the scientific community is that it is not good enough to observe it. We need to understand why, and we need to not be afraid to look at elephants in the room. This is a time for answers. Let's make sure we do everything that we can to make sure we've made a difference for tomorrow. So, Thank you all for joining me. I'd encourage you again, please, if you're interested in my UK data mortality analysis, please click on the link below, join at the Learn World School, and we'll have a lot of information to share with you over the next few months and year. Otherwise, join me on Substack. Have a great evening.